Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It is your AP Biology teacher, Mr. Poser. We are continuing our fifth unit on heredity by discussing topic 5.2, meiosis and genetic diversity. All right, so we're going to get a little bit more into detail about how meiosis works, but what we're really, really going to get into is how does meiosis produce genetic diversity? How does it produce variation? Um, so in our last topic, what we talked about was what variation is. It's like differences between organisms based on genetic traits, right? Um, so how does meiosis make that possible? Um, and there's three really three different things that really are going to be producing that um, that amounts of variation. And as I discussed in that last video as well, variation is crazy important when it comes to studying biology. All right, and understanding how biology works and how life works. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, differentiate a little bit more between meiosis and mitosis here. Um, at the end of the last video, we discussed how meiosis produces what we call four haploid, meaning they have one set of chromosomes each, non-identical cells, meaning that no set of those chromosomes that each gamete gets is the same, okay? And notice how I said gametes, which are those, those sex cells, sperm and egg. You get one gamete and another gamete, and you combine, okay? And you get a what we call a diploid cell with two sets of chromosomes, all right? Mitosis, how somatic cells or, you know, regular old body cells reproduce, is they just copy all their DNA and split apart, and that's it. You know, you get two daughter cells with the same exact DNA, and that's it. You know, they're the, they're the same. Okay, so how does life get so varied, and how are there so many different varieties of life? That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, how do we get all these different combinations of genes to produce all these different combinations of organisms, right? How come you're not exactly the same as everybody else? That's what we're going to discuss today. All right, so meiosis one, we can divide uh, meiosis up into two different categories here because in order to produce four cells, you have to divide twice. In order to produce two cells, you only have to divide once, right? So meiosis one is the first cell division in which a diploid cell with two sets of chromosomes with duplicated chromosomes become haploid cells with duplicated chromosomes, all right? So uh, take a look here. Um, in meiosis, what we were looking at uh, was, you know, each one of these homologous pairs would line up in the middle and then you, you know, split these up and each cell would get, uh, each daughter cell would eventually get one, you know, one set of chromosomes, right? Um, and, but, you know, they'd be diploid, okay, but they, the homologous pairs would be split up, right? So that's not happening in meiosis one, okay? Look at, this is what we call a tetrad, meaning that there's four chromosomes that are lined up here. We have two pairs each, okay, so that during metaphase one, look, there's four of them all together, anaphase, and then during telophase one in cyt cytokinesis, look, we got two sets still, okay? These are still haploid cells, meaning that these are just, you know, one set of chromosomes. They're just copied of those chromosomes, all right? Um, so we still got two haploid cells here, but during meiosis two, and I know these slides are kind of a mess here, meiosis two, the second cell division, haploid cells with those duplicated haploid chromosomes, okay, become haploid cells with unduplicated chromosomes. So this looks more, a little bit more like mitosis, right, where we got the homologous pairs lining up in the middle, and then they separate, and each cell gets one set of those unduplicated chromosomes, those haploid chromosomes, right? So there you have it. Um, that's meiosis. Instead of, you know, one homologous pair splitting up, we got two homologous pairs splitting up, and then they uh, split up in, so that each one of those four cells has one set of that different DNA. And how does that DNA become different? Well, we're going to find out today. So meiosis ensures that gametes receive a set of maternal and paternal chromosomes. And like I said before, metaphase pairs of homologs line up rather than the individual chromosomes. So we looked at homologous pairs um, last unit, right? Like I said, the pairs of homologs line up during metaphase one, and during anaphase one, duplicated chromosomes move towards the poles and sister chromatids stay attached, okay? So like, we kind of drew them as like X's, right? So there you have it. Um, duplicated chromosomes are migrating during anaphase one, all right? Uh, so here's a question that I'm going to pose to everybody, okay? What I've been beating to death here, the topic is that, um, you know, during fertilization, you get one set of genes from mom and you get one set of genes from dad, okay? So the egg cells have one set of their chromosomes and the sperm cells have another set of their chromosomes, 
Okay, and then when you combine, you get a little bit of mom, you get half mom, you get half dad's uh, genes and chromosomes. Okay, so I don't know about everybody watching, but you know, I have a sibling, I have an older brother, um, and we have the same mom and dad. And the question is here, so why am I not exactly the same as my older brother? Why am I not an I why am I not identical to him? Okay, if he's both 50% genes from mom and 50% genes from dad, and so am I, why are we not exactly the same? Well, let's talk about that. And then think about this in your case. Okay, if you've got a brother or sister with the same mom and dad, why aren't you exactly the same as them? Okay, well, genetic vari variation results from different combinations of each parent's chromosomes. Okay, you might get half of your chromosomes from mom and half your chromosomes from dad, but which variations of those chromosomes do you get from mom and which variations of those chromosomes do you get from dad? Okay? That's what's important here. Okay? You might be 50-50 just like your brothers and sisters, but you get a different combination of each of their genes. And it's not the same combinations of genes that you get. All right? This is what we get into here. It's called the, uh, the law of independent assortment. Okay, each pair of homologous chromosomes in metaphase one, which we just looked at, sorts its material maternal, excuse me, maternal and paternal homologs independently of every other pair. Okay, so in order to illustrate this, you know, that definition isn't really, you know, it's not super clear. Uh, so let's start off with uh, let's let's start off with an example here. Okay, so it's there it is. Let's say we have a cell with two chromosomes. Okay, it's simple enough, right? Here's our homologous pairs. Da, 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 da. It's very nice, two chromosomes each. All right, we got a diploid cell. All right, and then during mitosis, oh, this is ugly, okay? Uh, during, excuse me, meiosis, it duplicates its chromosomes. You know how it is. Wow, it does that every slide? Okay, during metaphase one, each pair of homologs lines up at the metaphase plate, okay? Just like we were looking at before. All right, so instead of, you, this is what we call a tetrad here. Tetra means four. Um, so, yeah, as you can see, we got four chromosomes there. All right, um, so they line up in the middle, okay, as we're seeing here, okay, but the way the chromosomes line up can produce different combinations of those chromosomes in gametes, okay? So, you know, we, we, we see that the homologs are going to be lining up, but the way that they line up really is going to have an effect on what material, what genetic material each gamete gets at the end of this whole meiosis process. Okay, so here's one possibility. Here's a different combination that they can line up in uh, where blue is all on one side and red is all on the other, but we could also have them line up like this. Okay, so we got two sets of chromosomes. We got two different ways to line them up. Okay, and if we follow this process to completion here, okay, uh, look, there's, you know, there's one gamete, there's another gamete undergoing meiosis one, and then meiosis two, look it. We got four different combinations of chromosomes that we can get at um, at the end of meiosis, right? So take a look. I just look at this left half of the screen here, okay? With possibility number one, okay, where they all they're kind of lined up like you know each color on one side, okay? These are pretty similar, right? So we got one two combinations there, okay? But with this possibility over here, where they kind of you know line up differently from one another. Okay, we get more variation. We get different combinations of the gametes when it comes to meiosis two, the end of meiosis two. All right, so we, as I pointed out down here, we end up with four different combinations of those those gametes that we are excuse me gametes uh, that we can have at the end of meiosis one. Or excuse, wow, meiosis two. Sorry, I'm out of it right now. Maybe I'm freaked out by my low battery over here. Um, so we got four different combinations of the gametes when we got two different ways the chromosomes can line up. Okay, um, so this is illustrating independent assortment. So what if we have three different pairs of chromosomes? Well, we can get eight different combinations um, dependent on the way these chromosomes line up, okay? So this is kind of like what we were looking at before. There are blue on one side, red on the other, okay? But we could have lots of different combinations and how these chromosomes are going to line up. And each one of these combinations are going to produce different combinations of gametes in, uh, excuse me, different combinations of chromosomes in those gametes at the end of meiosis two. Okay, so the way those chromosomes line up, and they line up what we call independently of one another. Okay, and one the, where one chromosome lines up does not affect where any of the other chromosomes line up. 
okay, produces a ton of variation depending on how many chromosomes there are. So think about this. Humans, as we know, have 23 pairs of chromosomes. All right, so that means according to our uh, laws of probability here, okay, instead of having three different pairs, we got 23 different pairs. That means we have two to the 23rd power combinations of gametes. Okay? If we had three chromosomes, there'd only be eight different combinations that you could get of gametes. Okay? But since we got 23, 23 gametes, or excuse me, 23 chromosomes can line up in different ways, okay? and you need two gametes in order to make a full organism, you get two to the 23rd times two to the 23rd combinations of genes that you can get per offspring. Crazy! Two to the 23rd? I, did I do the math? I think I did the math on the next page. Maybe I didn't. But it's, I think it ends up being like 72 trillion? 72 trillion different combinations of, uh, of genetic material within a human being? Okay, this is why I said before that you'll never be anybody like, there will never be anybody like you. And there never has been. Okay, right? because your set of chromosomes, your set of genes that you got from each of your mom and your dad, brand new, never before seen, and there's never going to be another one like you. So congratulations. Again, wonderful news, right? Um, so yeah, this is what we call independent assortment. All these chromosomes line up independently from one another, and the way they line up produces lots of different uh, combinations of those genes. And to make matters even more complicated and give us more variation within genes, there's a, something called crossing over that occurs. Okay, so going back to meiosis here, prophase one, um, when those chromosomes start to condense and they start to, you know, get ready to divide, um, crossing over occurs, which means that DNA molecules of non-sister chromatids are broken and rejoined to each other, and they occur at what we call chiasmata, all right, a chiasm um, between these chromosomes, right? So take a look at this. Um, this is what actually happens while these chromosomes are condensing, while these uh, homologous pairs are condensing. Um, they're trading they kind of trade segments of these chromosomes here. So instead of one solid blue and one solid red, we get a weird combination of both. All right, and this happens all the time um, during prophase one. We're getting brand new com combinations of these chromosomes um, because these, kinda, these genes kind of switch places during pro prophase one. Okay? And what we call these, these are recombinant chromosomes, individual chromosomes that carry genes from two different parents. All right, so when these cross over, we get another brand new set of chromosomes. All right, so if we even go back here, okay, look at, we're not even counting crossing over when we're talking about the variation that we can get from independent assortment, right? So look at, these are all like the solid colors, right? But what if we swapped them together? We'd have some chromosomes that are like part red and part blue and part whatever, um, and you'd, this is increasing the variation even more than it was, okay? So if we just had an independent assortment, there'd still be trillions of different combinations of human being. Now with crossing over, you get even more variation because they're, 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 they're switching spots, okay? And you're getting weird combinations of each uh, never before seen combinations of these chromosomes. Okay? So, you know, you're never gonna be the same as somebody else unless, of course, you're an identical twin. And that's, yeah, that's a whole other thing that we'll get into later. Uh, but yeah, as I said, crossing over produces even more possible combinations of genes in gametes. Um, and finally, this third topic here is that random fertilization occurs. Okay? You, it's impossible to determine which sperm cell out of millions and millions and millions and millions and millions that are produced will fertilize an egg. Okay? So random fertilization ensures maximum possible combinations. There's no sperm cell with a set of chromosomes that's going to be more likely to fertilize the egg than others. It's completely random, okay? So there you have it. Three rules here that are going to produce as much genetic diversity as a pro product of meiosis as possible. Crossing over, where the genes switch places on the chromosomes and each gamete gets new combinations of those uh, chromosomes, independent assortment, which happens during metaphase one, and the way the chromosomes line up um, can determine which uh, chromosomes each gamete gets, and then the fact that fertilization is random. There's no one sperm cell that's going to be more likely to fertilize the egg than another.
So there you have it. Those three processes produce genetic variation through meiosis. All right, that's what I wanted to get to today for topic 5.2. We're going to get into Mendelian genetics, uh, which is some of the fun stuff of uh, genetics um, in our next video. All right, so have a great day, and we will see you next time. Bye.